Welcome and thank you for tuning in for another episode of the Psychor Water Cooler, the casual conversation podcast dedicated to covering all things related to Psychor, including product updates, implementations, insights, getting the most out of your Psychor investment, and more. I'm your host, John Price, Psychor Practice Director and MVP at AmericanEagle.com. To set the stage for today, the e-commerce technology space is a crowded one, especially now with the push towards composable business, architecture, and technology. Companies now have more choices than ever before to solve for their use cases. However, there is one technology company that is forever innovating and pushing to drive more transactions and conversions in, in the e-commerce space. That technology is Coveo. Coveo has leveraged its world-class machine learning, AI, and relevancy platform and have fine-tuned it for the e-commerce world. I'm very excited for today's episode as I am joined at the water cooler by Simon Langevin from Coveo, who I have had the pleasure of working with and collaborating with for over eight years. Simon, welcome to the show. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. So, Simon, you are currently the Senior Director of Product Management, specifically Coveo for e-commerce. Um, it's also interesting to point out that you and I started at Coveo and American Eagle at the exact same month back in 2013. It's no wonder both of our companies have flourished since then. <laughs> but, tell <Indeed>. us, <laughs> but tell us a little bit more about yourself, your role, and your history at Coveo. Sure thing. Uh, so, nine years, yeah, nine years of the making at, uh, at Coveo. Uh, I went through uh, field services and support, then solution architect, and I was the head of the Sitecore line of business, uh, where I, I, you know, kind of uh, put my toes in in Sitecore, became a Sitecore certified uh, developer, and even Sitecore MVP for three years, uh, before unfortunately leaving it behind me. Um, although we're still heavily into Sitecore, and I'm still aware of it, uh, to move to the e-commerce line of business, where I. Uh, we pretty much started that product from scratch um, using the learning mostly from the Sitecore side, the first few uh, commerce clients we had on the Sitecore side. So we've been doing that for the last uh, two years and a half, almost three years now. Yeah, very cool. I'm sure you pretty much saw it all in the Sitecore space, website, use cases, e-commerce use cases, and anything in between. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, and you know, as Coveo has grown and has positioned itself you know, as a relevancy and machine learning powerhouse, Yo, Simon, can you tell us about the latest and greatest developments by Coveo and kind of what's on the horizon of future releases when it comes to e-commerce? Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of, um, of search vendor uh, will expand into you know other areas. Uh, some of them will go into CMS, into e-commerce engine. Uh, what, we, what we decided to do is really focus on search, uh, really focus on uh, making sure that search, product listings, and a bit of recommendation where uh, really we were trying to push the, the science as far as possible. And I would say in the last two years, our main investment uh, when it comes to search, search relevance, has been around uh, semantics and, uh, and product vectors. Uh, so semantics overall with words, so mostly understanding the intent between a keyword, you know, understanding usually in the index, what is the before, what is the after of that keyword? And then when we see that keyword being typed, understanding you know, what is the intent, where the, the user is going with that. And now with, with products, uh, we decided to do the same thing, but it's a thing called product vectors, uh, where mostly we will understand what's happening before that product and what's happening after that product. So we'll have that, that kind of vector map uh, that will tell us a bit, you know, again, what is the intent with the visit of that product or with the add to cart of that product. And this is used uh, to re-rank, obviously, for search, or to re-rank for each user one-to-one, -one, which we call anonymous one-to-one. -one. So even users that are not logged in um, will have always a ranking that is customized for them in real time based on their current intent. Uh, this is also used, obviously, for suggestions, so query suggestion, product suggestion. And we're starting to use it more and more for recommendations and such. Uh, so that's pretty much, you know, the main area of investment in the last uh, in the last two years, and more recently, uh, at the end of last year, we uh, purchased a company called Qubit, um, and this has been really our, our investment more on the merchandising side. So Qubit brings a lot of expertise as well as a very neat UI uh, for merchandisers, uh, and we're bringing Caveo into that UI so that merchandisers can own uh, search listings, but in a way that makes sense to them. So I'm assuming with the analytics engine on the e-commerce side, you guys are also taking things in like add to carts and other type of e-commerce transactions. Yeah, absolutely. So that that's really uh, that's been a, a pretty big shift, I would say, when we build that product. Um, you know, moving from you know the journey from the search all the way to clicking on the on the on the product or content 
um, all the way to, okay, let's take the entire journey from land to conversion and even including refund or even offline, um, for example, you know, POS system, what's happening in the store. Uh, so, so definitely our footprint in the analytics tracking intelligence ecosystem has grown exponentially, I think, when we, when we got into the e-commerce uh, line of business. Very cool. Yeah, and I know with your your historical search product, if I go just focusing on Coveo for Sitecore, right? There are certain components, query suggests, the listing pages. What are all the like front end user or we'll call them the front end user components that your e-commerce product offers offers? Yeah. It it really goes around the same thing, right? Because we don't want to be the experience. We want to be the 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 intelligence behind the experience. So and especially with headless and all. Uh, these pre-built components now are, are, are still extremely simple. You'll have the search results set. You'll have, you know, what you what you do, you mentioned the, the search suggestion, the query suggestion. Uh, we're adding, you know, some of these components, like for example, uh, an add to cart button uh, is something that you'll have specifically in e-commerce. But again, if you want to go a bit more composable, more headless, it's a good chance you won't use that component. Um, so, so it's been really um, that's. There hasn't been a lot of specific components. I would say where we really invested are maybe more on the product recommendation side. Uh, so, you know, when you're in a website context, you have that kind of content recommendation, uh, which is a bit more of a, an, I would say, kind of a generic component that will return content related to what you're looking for. Uh, with commerce, we decided to become more and more precise with, with specific headless controller or headless, uh, sorry, with uh, UI components where uh, you'll have a recommendation for the cart as opposed to a recommendation for the home page or recommendation for the product listing page as opposed to a product detail page. So that has been, you know, I would say the things that are very specific when it comes to DX, when it comes to components and controllers and such. Now, that's a great approach, especially with the composable world, right? Because now your product can basically be, be leveraged on any platform, which is fantastic. Can you think of any customers off the top of your head? Um, it doesn't have to be in Sitecore, but that are using your latest e-commerce technology really well or really in a really sophisticated manner. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it it all it all depends on on the type of client. So if I start with a joint Sitecore client, um, Caleris, uh, and actually one of their sub brand, which is uh, more known famous footwear. Um, so what they decided to use uh, mostly, they're using. Yes, uh, the vector-based search that I mentioned, but under the hood, uh, they have a multi-layer catalog. Um, and we had to really improve on the product in this sense where out of the box, Caveo will understand what is a product, what is a product variant, what is a product availability constraint, like a store or something like that. Uh, so if you go, for example, on famousfootwear.com uh, today, you do a search, you filter on your local store, um, all of the attributes, including attributes that are not on the product, such as uh, the width of the shoes, the size of the shoes, they will all update automatically based on your local store. So you will never have, you know, that kind of back and forth uh, between the product detail page and the product listing page or the search page, uh, which you can have on, you know, on other sites, some of their competitors. Uh, so that's, you know, one approach. Uh, we have some clients like, for example, Bass Pro Shop, uh, who are not using Sitecore. Um, in their case, uh, what they are using is really that vector-based search extensively. So if you start a journey, Bass Pro Shop, you know, extend from hunting and firearms to fishing, to camping, to, you know, a lot of these different, uh, um, these different kind of uh, activities. Uh, and if you start, you know, a journey, a completely anonymous journey, and you go more on the fishing side of things, uh, it will affect the product, it will affect your query suggestion, it will affect your recommendation. Uh, so that's where, you know, you can actually see it. And maybe to close, uh, Bunnings, uh, which is actually using Sitecore, not for commerce though, but for uh, content. So Bunnings is a DIY store, the largest in Australia. Um, when you when you search on Bunnings, you'll have product content and you'll have uh, community content as well as, well as uh, DIY article content and recommendation as well on the product or on that content uh, will kind of move between the Sitecore that contains the content and uh, the PIM that contains obviously the product data and everything is kind of orchestrated uh, by Kaveo. Uh, so that's another usage of kind of tying, you know, external rich content to product content at, at Bundling. So that, those are kind of three use cases. They're using Kaveo differently 
um, but they're using pretty much all of them AI to power all of those experiences. Very cool. Yeah, some great context there about some B2C use cases. How about B2B? So I know the B2B world's ever-changing, especially with the new composable world. A lot of B2B companies after COVID have to change their technology stack, rethink of how they're, how they're doing business. You know, how can Coveo help address some of the B2B challenges on the horizon? Yep. And actually, that that's quite a, that's quite a good segue because um, Sitecore, a lot of our biggest client, I would say, on the Sitecore side were mostly B2B business that didn't really have the need to go D2C at the time because, you know, the pandemic was not there yet. Uh, so they had what I call catalog browsing. Uh, so already, you know, that experience around catalogs, around B2B use cases started to build up a little bit while we were still doing heavy Sitecore website search. Um, so for B2B, uh, the big, the, you know, the, the big challenge that we saw in the last uh, two, three years has been really the scale, uh, scale and volume. So, you know, you want to do some advanced AI, uh, but you have, you know, a thousand visits per month. Uh, but each of those visits, however, spend thousands of dollars on, you know, some, some specific um whether pieces or parts, uh, one of my clients is doing trucks and trailer parts. I have some in healthcare. Um, so you have, uh, you know, a lot of repetition, not that much room for machine learning, and a catalog that sometimes goes beyond, you know, the wildest dream of a B2C retailer. So you have, you know, a few million items times a few hundred thousand price book entries, meaning a flattened combination of several billion items. Um, and then you have, you know, these B2B client that gets to you and say, okay, I want to move to the cloud. I want to have, you know, that, that new personalization uh, that you are offering. I want to, to use AI, but I am stuck with that, you know, array of solar indices that I've built uh, where I'm spreading my content across, you know, all of these different indices. How can you help me? Um, and this is really where, you know, we have been investing a lot on obviously the scale of our index, but most importantly, the relationship in between, you know, the price book and the product so that you don't necessarily need to flatten it out. So, a, you know, an index that has several billion items uh, can be reduced to an index of about, you know, back to my maybe 2 million items plus 500,000 price books. And then you'll sum, you know, to 2.5 million total items which is completely manageable by a modern index. Um, so that has been, you know, one of the biggest challenge. Uh, on the AI side, I did mention, you know, that very few um, users visiting. It means that your AI needs to learn um, in a situation where there's very little data. And so far, I would say in the AI business overall, um, we have been extremely dependent on the quality of data and we will still be, we'll be until, you know, until the end of time, but there are now alternative approach. Um, and now with vector-based search that I introduced a little bit earlier, uh, what we're able to do is from the, the from day one, from the moment we get the catalog data, we're able to do a first analysis. And then we keep you know, that learning instead of accumulating journeys and trying to find repetition in user journey, we're actually keeping that information in the product themselves. So the little bit of information that we receive, the little bit of, um, I would say, user's behavior or interaction with these products, we're able to keep it with the product itself. Um, and this means that this product, in order for us to evaluate this product and, and you know, where, it should, where it should be, um, it takes us a lot less data. Also, what this allows us to do is to look at product A, which is, let's say, a popular product overall, and then product B, which is extremely rare, or could be, you know, somewhat the same product, but for some reason it is behind a certain entitlement. So it has a specific price or something like that. In a typical journey to journey situation in AI, that first product will be ranked really high while the second one will be pretty much discarded. Uh, what we're able to do is to look at, okay, are these two products similar in a way uh, with what we understand from them? And then we'll be able to take the learning that we have from product A and then translate it to product B uh, and rank product B accordingly. So that's why the investment that we've done mostly on the BDC side to enable for quick real-time anonymous personalization is now being used more and more on the B2B side, which to be honest, in the, in the last few months, we've been, we've been doing a lot of B2B 
um, in order just to give a kind of default base ranking and to, to give at least a, a first good kind of um, a good base for relevance into a B2B context. That's really good. That seems like a pretty good differentiator um, between Covey and some of your competitors, especially in a B2B space. And I'm curious, right, if I stay on that topic or that question real quick is, you know, beyond some of these use cases you mentioned, you know, kind of how you've refactored some of these B2B use cases, what are just some other general key differentiators that the audience should take away of, you know, why Coveo maybe um, versus some of your competitors in B2C or B2B in either use case? Sure thing. Uh, so in B2C, I will just, you know, kind of step back a bit, go back to what I said with vector-based search. Um, the So most of the the shoppers in B2C uh, have, have no login. Uh, you know, about 85 to 90% of your users will be unknown. Um, and that's why, you know, the, the vector-based search is an extremely important differentiator because it we keep the data, again, on the product side. So we're able to adjust in real time when a new, what we call a cold shopper comes in and they start, you know, looking at different products, uh, they start their journey. After two or three interaction, we'll be able to cluster that user uh, to figure out that that user, you know, is interested by a certain type of product, is is you know following a certain path that we know. And even if if it's a known user, so let's say it's a user that has a past history with us, um, the current intent will always prime over historical intent. Uh, so we will update. So a lot of vendors out there will do you know, bring us historical data and then we'll have a homepage that says, you like flowers, here are flowers. Um, in the case of Cabello, we always tend, we always think that we know nothing and then we'll start evolving and reacting in real time. Also that, that kind of cold start vectors, uh, which is, you know, when I said, you know, you're taking a, a product that is well known, a product that is not well known, and then you do that kind of translation. So we call that cold start vector or the cold start product problem. Uh, this is also, you know, a, a big area investment on our side. And we consider that a main differentiator because even in some of our biggest, um, you know, our, our client with the most volume, uh, overall, the, the default AI would have a catalog coverage of about 30%. Um, because about 80% of your visitors will look at the 20, 30% um, products in your catalog. So you're missing a lot of opportunity uh, when it comes to product discovery. So I would say, you know, overall catalog coverage, real-time personalization, um, you know, path to conversion, product discovery on the B2C side has been, you know, our main area of focus. And obviously with the acquisition of Qubit now, um, bringing more and more of that merchandising control uh, to, to search and listings and such. On the B2B front, um, I, I mentioned already, you know, cold start vectoring, all these kind of things, supporting entitlement from day one, uh, being able to have you know, thousands of versions of the same product so that you can have the right price, the right detail, the right description and information for each of your clients. That has been the main differentiator. I would say the other part is obviously the uh, extensive array of connectors that could be open. So obviously, you know, in the Sitecore ecosystem, that was one of the advantage that we had is to bring content from outside of Sitecore all the way to Sitecore. We did the same thing on the Salesforce line of business as well. Uh, and in commerce, especially in B2B, it is still relevant. So bringing, for example, tech sheets or even just um, bringing different attributes of the product. Uh, so the one of the feature of, of Caveo is what we call partial item update, where you can simply send you know, a specific SKU with a specific field and update that product without rebuilding the entire product. So for some B2B use cases, the product can be built you know, from four different sources and then you have to build that kind of proxy before the index where you rebuild that item. Uh, with Cavill, you don't need to do that. Um, you can send just the data as they come in, as they are changed um, and have your, your index built. So this is a bit, you know, the, some of the, the elements we focus on. And if I was going to summarize all those and why I've really enjoyed working with the platform for the past, you know, seven, eight years is, you know, to summarize all those points is scalability, right? Coveo can really help businesses scale. On the B2C side, you mentioned being able to take a user, being able to, I'll just simplify it, group them for what they may be interested in. Um, and then the B2B side, you highlighted some nice use cases where, you know, people can't go in and manually attribute, you know, millions or billions of records and saying this one should be the right one, right? This Coveo helps 
scale and automate a lot of that process. So I think that's just to kind of summarize, that's a great differentiator just from my perspective, from a simplicity standpoint, is how you're able to let B2C and B2B companies and e-commerce companies, you know, scale. So I think that's fantastic. You know, one other topic I wanted to ask about is reporting, right? So it's, it, reporting is especially important um, with e-commerce. I know you guys have newer integrations of Snowflake over the last couple of years. What can you tell us about some of the, the robust reporting capabilities inside Coveo Commerce? Absolutely. So I will be fully transparent. It's been quite a journey uh, in the reporting sphere. And I think, you know, you know, for everyone that wants to go into reporting BI and all that in e-commerce, I think what I would say here might be relevant to them. So we started really with the same approach that we used to have, you know, we will give you dashboards uh, and you'll be able to pretty much push any kind of data you want to it and then modify your dashboard. Uh, but one of the first lessons we learn is, um, you know, in e-commerce, there's already a lot of, you know, uh, engine out there, a lot of BI system. Uh, lots of the clients already have, um, you know, all of that information about how much revenue they drive or anything like this. So what they're really interested in is pretty much attribution. You know, the, the key word is attribution. So our first investment, I would say, you know, about two years ago has been in creating a uh, multi-touch attribution uh, system where you are able to understand exactly where Caveo brings value uh, into your entire, you know, your entire sales pipeline. So that has been the main thing. And then building dashboard around that. So uh, we started to build these kind of overview dashboard where you see, you know, the attribution of revenue to the different Caveo features. But then we got to that kind of second challenge, which is, um, I don't want to see that in your dashboard or, you know, I want to see that specific thing um, that your overview dashboard is not necessarily showing. So then, you know, you mention it, um, we, we move pretty much everything onto Snowflake and we started to open to all of our clients what we call a Snowflake, a Snowflake reader account. And more recently, um, we've built a e-commerce attribution data model where the attribution was already calculated. So as a user, as a client, um, you can query the Snowflake Reader account and actually ask for that data model that already has attribution computed. So instead of re receiving you know, raw data that says you got that many purchases, you will receive the, the raw data still, but that will tell you here are purchases that can be attributed to search, to listings, or to recommendation. And then you can you know, power any of your report um, with that. The next step, uh, with the with the acquisition of Qubit, uh, with you know more proximity to the merchant, um, is to bring data where the decision is taken. Uh, so mostly, you know, one of the things that we learned a lot with Qubit is that <laughs> I'm sorry, most of their feature were tied into what we call campaigns. So mostly, you will start a campaign, and then you will say, you know, I want to boost a certain product or I want to recommend something specific for a certain period of time with a specific availability. Um, and then the first thing that you want to see is data. You want to see, you know, is it helping us convert more? Uh, is it increasing my revenue per visit? Is it affecting my margin? Uh, so this is all information you want to know. Uh, and with that new data model, this allows us to bring, you know, these tiny bits of data, that kind of granular, um, that granular view of that specific campaign on your entire e-commerce strategy how does it affect your top line? How does it affect your revenues and such? So that's pretty much, you know, the current the current investment. So that has been, you know, our journey through analytics. Um, and, and I would say, I think it's a journey also of pretty much all e-commerce vendor out there. I think that's, you know, attribution has always been the, the hard thing. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, and looking into the future, you know, I'm interested in what you can share, you know, whether it's reporting, whether it's use cases or just your general technology. What does the future hold for Coveo e-commerce? Let's just say in the next year, year to two years, what can you share on some new exciting releases or developments you guys are currently working on? Yep. So it's mostly these kind of two, uh, the, I would say these kind of two facets. The first one being, you know, the merchandiser bringing more and more intelligence to the merchant uh, so that they they are able to, you know, build a search uh, a search page, but mostly being able to build a listing page, run a campaign, choose uh, what is visibility on it and then see the outcome of it um, that is really you know in the next year 
in the next two years this is going to be our main focus and we're pretty much just going to incrementally um augment the, the the visibility that that merchant has on on his or her campaign um on the ai side uh we'll keep doubling down on semantics on vectors that's really where we believe the truth is um you know bringing new ways to do tagging from day one uh to be able to understand for example the images <coughs> sorry, of the product and being able to automatically um, make it an assumption on it, being able to increase uh, the size of the coverage um, that we have from day one on each individual catalogs. So this is really, you know, the, the main, I would say the main area of investment. So it's just pushing search more and more and more uh, in order to understand, you know, the moment someone types a single, a single letter, uh, we'll be able to return the first product the first suggestion will be exactly what they are looking for. Um, and on the B2B front, um, we're, I would say my main goal is to take these on-premise giants and bring them to the cloud. Um, and, you know, that's, that's an, an area of scale. But one of the things that we're being asked a lot and we're going to double down on is guided search. Uh, so focusing, yes, on search precision, but also on, you know, guiding the user as they move forward. So they type a query. If we're not 100% sure what they want, instead of returning product, why don't we return filters? Why don't we say, you know, we're not entirely sure where you want to be, but this could be, you know, of interest for you. Um, so this is another area in this, of investment. And I would say, you know, the, the last thing, if we combine everything, so vectors, merchandising, guided search, at the, at the core of it all is optimization for business value. So... What we want to do is to make sure that if you say to the, tomorrow that for the next quarter, you want to focus on profitability. So, you know, on optimizing margin without necessarily affecting your revenues, but you don't necessarily want to focus that much on conversion anymore. You know, you want to make sure that it's your high margin uh, item or you want to reduce, you know, your shipping costs or something like that. We're able to automatically update all of our models, change all, all of your campaign and tell you, here's the strategy that you should take in order to optimize that. So really become that kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of helper uh, for the merchandisers. Love the roadmap. And the way you just summarize, it's perfect, right? It's basically putting at the fingertips of the marketer or the merchandiser. Here's what you should do next, or here's your path to more KPIs, more conversions, et cetera. That's fantastic to hear. Now, last question for today, right? So again, very impressed with the Coveo Commerce product, where you guys are going. You know, a Cycor Symposium ahead here in about a week or so, and Coveo is going to have a presence there. You still have a tight partnership with Cycor. You know, and even though we live in a composable world, is there anything specific Cycor users should be looking out for Coveo Commerce this year as Symposium or anything that you think they might be able to take away just, you know, from a high level? Yep. Um, so obviously a lot of it will come from outside of the psycho integration because obviously of the composable that you mentioned um you know more and more investment into uh lighter um into lighter components so you know the the hive um the high framework which was at the time in sxa uh is getting a little bit heavy uh for you know for uh, for some that want to go more into a composable environment so we're bringing uh, the headless framework uh, to Secor, we're bringing the atomic framework, which is built on top of it. So these are all things, you know, that uh, that we're looking at that we're gonna, you know, share with uh, with participants at the Psycho Symposium. Um, also, obviously, increase connectivity to other system as well to bring more data inside of Psycor. Again, in that idea of composable, where you'll have more and more of these kind of you know, smaller headless CMS that you might use for single purpose or something like that. So bringing that content in um, and also, you know, the, the, the strategy with uh, the new Cycor Cloud product, which started as Cycor SaaS, now it's going to XM, XM Cloud. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the, the connectivity, uh, the, the, some strategies to index that new XM Cloud as well. Um, I would say these will be pretty much, you know, the talking points as we, as we head into the Cycor Symposium. No, that's great insight, Simon. You know, I th especially as legacy Sitecore clients kind of contemplate like, hey, I'm on a you know older version, I'm on SXA or even Greenfield. What do I do with Sitecore's composable stack? And the really the direction is composable and headless. So it sounds like you guys are gonna yep. you're gonna solve that use case with headless atomic and some of these other technologies, which is great to see. So a, 
my, even my personal advice to Sitecore clients is, you know, that is the wave of the future. That's where the product is going. That's where your investments are going. And, you know, the old proverbial, hey, just upgrade your Sitecore version is not really, you know, going to be the case anymore. People really need to be looking at these new technologies that kind of future proof. So it's good to hear that's where you guys are moving as well. But Simon, I think this is a great stopping point for today's episode as we covered some rich topics that I'm sure the audience found insightful. You know, I appreciate us working together for the past eight years, and I greatly appreciate your time today in swinging by the Sycor Water Cooler to discuss your experiences and where Coveo is going as a product. And, uh, you know, as always, hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. Thanks again to Simon Langevin from Coveo for joining us today on the Sycor Water Cooler podcast, a casual conversation between colleagues and peers centered around all things Sycor. I'm your host, John Price, and until next time we meet at the Water Cooler, be sure to subscribe to the Sycor Water Cooler podcast today wherever you find your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios with special thanks to executive producers Renee Nelson, Julia Klepich, and Brian Winger. 